welcome to our event today on what's next for the financial services industry. We have a conversation here and are very pleased and honored to host today uh, Monsieur Philippe Donnet. He's the CEO of um, the uh, of Generali Group, um, and it uh, has a distinguished career, of course, in insurance, in finance, um, in business. So you're a very experienced uh, manager, knowing uh, not just insurance, but much more broadly the financial services industry. And the plan for today, this morning, is really to uh, to have a bit of time um, to uh, discuss among the two of us um, what are the key issues, the key challenges, uh, but also the key opportunities for uh, financial services um, at this stage. And one big topic, obviously, is um, the low interest rate environment, how to deal with um, the low interest rate environment. Um, another big topic um, is... Um, is green financing um, and, of course, also the financing of an industrial uh, strategy and many, many other points I'm sure we will touch upon. Um, but perhaps we end b before I um, I start asking you my first question. Um, let me also mention that we do have the option to, uh, to uh, engage with you. Uh, this time we decided to go through Slido so as to also allow um, people that watch us on live stream uh, to uh, to ask questions, I will look at. Um, so don't be offended if I look at my smartphone. I will look actually at uh, at the questions that will come in um, on my smartphone, um, and uh, and uh, then uh, towards the end, ask a few questions from uh, from Slido to you. But perhaps before we start, uh, be, uh, be before I start looking at Slido, let's let's have a conversation here between the two of us. Um, and I think the first, my first question is really, I mean, you are, of course, group CEO of a major insurance. Um, perhaps you can just uh, tell us a bit and tell our audience a bit, where do we stand in terms of um, where do you see also generally in the uh, European landscape? Thank you, Gutram. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, if you don't mind, uh, I would like to say that I'm not that much comfortable with this idea of financial services industry. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, saying this, you put very different things together. For example, banks and insurance companies, asset managers, and we are talking about different businesses. Mm -hmm. So for me, as generally, we are in the insurance business mm -hmm. and in the asset management business, and that's it. So I don't feel a part of a so-called financial industry. Right. I think it's important to say it because uh, too often... Uh, everybody, including regulators, they put uh, insurance companies together with banks, and it's not the same business, and we are not talking about the same risks. So, as I said, Generali uh, is uh, an international, Italian international group specialized in life insurance, property casualty insurance, and asset management. Uh, we were born as an international company, and this makes us very different from our European competitors, which were born as domestic companies and became international through acquisitions, generally has a very different uh, DNA. Mm. Uh, we were born in uh, 1831 in Trieste, when Trieste was not even Italy. It was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And then in 1832, uh, generally set up uh, the head office for Italy in Venice, in uh, San Marco Square. The reason why we share uh, the same symbol as the city of Venice, the San, Mark, San Marco Lion. And after one year, uh, Generali had already, uh, after one, one year after its foundation, uh, Generali had already opened 14 business offices in all across Europe. Mm. So uh, I would say that uh, generally, uh, unlike uh, most of its European competitors, was born as a European company, a European group. And this is very important. It's really part of <coughs> our DNA. As of today, when you look at the premium, uh, generally is the leader in the insurance business in Europe. And not only we are proud uh, of this leadership position, but we view it not as a weakness, but uh, as a strength, 
and as a, as a great opportunity for for us. Uh, we don't think that uh, in the insurance business or in the asset management business, growth will come only from Asia, mm -hmm. uh, for example. Uh, we think that uh, in our business, there is a huge potential for growth in Europe. Mm -hmm. So we are very happy uh, to be already a European leader. And by the way, in our new strategic plan, we are now uh, almost at the middle of our, uh, the third of our new strategic plan, uh, we aim to further strengthen our leadership position in Europe. We uh, will grow very significantly in all our European markets. This mm. is uh, a so everything uh, which is about Europe is important to us, mm. matters a lot to us. And I would say I'm also personally a, a European citizen, being a, a French and uh, being the CEO of a, an Italian international group. So I feel uh, really uh, European and both as the CEO of Generali and as a European citizen, um, I think that uh, we should go for more integration in Europe, mm. social integration, fiscal mm. integration, fi financial, economical integration. Europe has to become more, more integrated. And I think that the recent Brexit <coughs> is an opportunity to uh, think again about the European model. But are we sure? that without more integration, Europe has a great future. Mm. I'm not sure. I do not see a future in Europe out of a, of a stronger integration. But if we want to go in Europe for a stronger integration, we need a stronger leadership uh, in Europe, a stronger political leadership in Europe. It's a pity that uh, very often uh, Europe is uh, unable uh, to speak with one voice, the European voice. So we need to strengthen the European voice. We need to further integrate Europe. We need a stronger political mm. leadership in Europe. So a passionate plaidoyer for more Europe. Um, perhaps we can spend one minute uh, also talking about integration in the insurance sector. So you operate in several countries, obviously. Um, can you just say a few words uh, whether there are obstacles um, that you think uh, regulators um, need to address that prevent you from operating across borders? I mean, what's the main obstacles for you to have an integrated insurance market? No, the, the, the problem is, uh, you know, it's, it's fine for us to, uh, to have a local business in uh, most European countries. This mm. is how we live and it's fine because, you know, the business, the insurance business remains a very local business, mm. unlike the banking business, because a, a, a bank account is the same everywhere. An insurance policy, whether it's a property casualty insurance policy mm. or a life insurance policy, is very uh, related to the local, uh, to the local laws to the local way, way of life. So it's, uh, it's, it's a very local business. Mm -hmm. What's important to me is the consistency of the local regulations and the consistency between regulation and, and politics. Uh, that's, uh, that's important. So uh, why do we have different uh, uh, regulations across the country? It's true that there is some convergence of the regulation uh, with Solvency 2. Solvency 2 is an example. It's a European regulation because we also have EOPA, which, which is the European regulator for, for insurance. Mm. But the reality is that uh, every local company is regulated by a local regulator and the rules are not always the same. Mm. I think uh, this, is, uh, this is okay. This is something we, uh, we can manage. For me, what's more important is to build, to increase the consistency between the public policies and the regulation. Uh, maybe this is not a topic no. we will cover when we will, when we, if we address the, the investment, the, the, the strategy for investment, especially for green investments. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's perhaps talk a bit about, um, uh, uh, before talking about sustainability, talk, let's talk a bit about um, the low, in the low interest rate environment. And, and of course, the insurance 
industry, like many other industries in the financial, even though it's not all the same, but uh, I mean, many, many investors um, certainly suffer from the problem that rates are very low and um, pension funds also, of course, and um, that um, they see difficulties actually having any returns uh, in the current uh, low rate environment. The counter argument, uh, and I think if you look at, at the number, uh, at the numbers, I mean the uh, the forecasts for interest rates at 20 years ahead are basically still zero, right? So so this is not a short term phenomenon. Financial market signals currently tell us for the next 20 years we're gonna gonna have rates around zero. Um, so uh, so this um, this is an issue for for insurances. This is an issue for other investors. How do you deal with this problem? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I have a, a personal experience about this because uh, I've been living, uh, 15 years ago, I've been living in Japan, four mm -hmm. years, and I've been managing uh, or I've been turning around a life insurance company in Japan 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was convinced that at some point the Japanese scenario uh, would, uh, would come to Europe and it came as a matter of fact it came and I thought it was important to acquire this experience and uh, today uh, together with two of uh, our top managers we mm. own the experience they were together with me in Japan so 100% of uh, the European experience on Japanese scenario is in Generali so this is very convenient mm. and uh, when, when <laughs> I joined Generali uh, six years ago as the CEO for Italy, uh, I was already convinced that um, low interest would uh, last for almost ever and that uh, we should uh, prepare uh, the company to deal with this new environment. And we started doing this and we were the first movers. We started doing this six, six years ago. I remember that nobody was believing me. Everybody was saying uh, interest rates are so low that they can only raise again. Mm. I said uh, they are so low that uh, they will go down again. Uh, and it can never stop. So uh, I've been through this. I know what it represents. Um, I think... Um, it's an easy solution, uh, and we enter in this easy solution uh, without thinking about the future. Because the reality is nobody knows how you get out of it. Nobody has this experience. And for me, it's very dangerous to enter in a scenario when you don't know how you get out of it. I'm not convinced that even if uh, the uh, ECB uh, I would like to, to change, uh, to, to, to improve the situation. I, I don't know if they, they can do it. Mm. You know, it's a bit like um, a drug. Uh, you know, if you are sick at some point, it's good to, to take it for a while. It helps. And this is true. I'm not saying that it didn't have any positive impact during the crisis. I'm not saying this. I'm just saying that at some point you need to stop taking the drug mm. because if you don't stop if you take it for too long you get addicted and if you get addicted you cannot stop you can never stop so this is dangerous this is dangerous and when i'm saying it's dangerous i'm not saying it's dangerous only for uh, the insurance companies the banks the pension funds it's dangerous for the people it destroys the confidence of the people in the future if they don't have confidence, they make no children anymore. So it, it has a very negative effect on, on, on the people. Look at Japan. Uh, mm. Low and negative interest rates go together with a negative demography. Mm. So which is well, responsible for what? I don't know, but it well, goes that's together. That's a big debate. Huh? I, mean, so, so I think there is even a debate that the rates are low because... Um, uh, yes, you know, it's uh, like the, the, working the egg. population is shrinking. It's like the egg and the chicken. <laughs> well, you don't know w what is responsible for what. But the reality is it, the risk, it, it, goes, it goes together. Another issue of the very low or negative interest rates is for the retired people. It's very difficult 
to fund uh, a retirement. Mm. So, uh, so it, it's <coughs> and this is a disaster, a social disaster, and I would say also a political disaster. I've seen in Japan uh, retirees starving in the streets. Mm. I've seen this because you know uh, when you enter this kind of environment, you need to sacrifice someone. This is terrible in Japan. They sacrifice the uh, retirees. And you know that in Europe, we are starting having uh, issues with uh, pension. So I think it's very important to, to, to think seriously about it. It's not, it's not an issue for generally no. the low interest rate, because as I said, we started preparing our company six years ago. We completely changed the business mix. We are selling uh, protection and risk products. We uh, have been working hard to immunize our business against uh, the low interest rate. So uh, we, can, we can live with this for a very long period of time. Of course, it would be better for everybody to have higher interest rate, but we can, we can live with this. We are now uh, selling products without any guarantees. Uh, we are selling uh, light capital products. So we completely changed the, the business mix. So for generally, it's fine for uh, Europe, because we are talking mostly about mm. a European problem. If it, lasts, if it lasts too long, it will become an issue, yeah. and the, the positive effects will uh, vanish, will disappear, and we will start getting the negative effects if it, start, if it lasts too long. Well, I mean, uh, as you said, we don't really know why the rates are so low for so long, and we don't know how to get out of it, really. Yes. Uh, and if demography is the main driver, um, it's actually very difficult to change it. So, so perhaps we can focus a bit on uh, uh, what what have you done at the company, really, to uh, to address this? Because, of course, um, uh, when I talk to representatives of other financial service industries, I mean, they would usually tell me, well, the ECB finally has to raise rates because otherwise I'm out of business, right? And um, now you seem to say, well, you know, we have prepared and we, we can deal with this. Um, now, do, do you just cover your costs uh, through higher fees on, on your customers? Or, I mean, how do you deal with, with this low rate? I mean, with this low rate issue? Because you have the assets, right? And if the assets don't, I mean, okay, stock, you can invest into stocks, um, but there are limits to that um, also. So, so how do you deal with this? Well, to, to, to make the story short, right. uh, obviously the life insurance business is more impacted by uh, low and negative interest rates than the property casualty uh, business. It's <coughs> easier to, to manage it for the property casualty business. You just have to uh, increase uh, the rates, the, the prices, to mitigate the negative impact of the, um, of the low interest rates. Mm. It's much more complicated for the life insurance uh, business because basically, you need to change the, the products you, you offer to the, to the customer. You need to switch from products with, uh, I'm talking about the savings mm. business, obviously. Mm. You need to switch from the um, products with guarantees, uh, which is the traditional products of, of an insurance company, to products with no guarantees, which means basically to unit link products. Mm. Okay? Uh, so basically, uh, if you take out the, uh, the life insurance um, environment, uh, the, 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 the protection, the, the, the fiscal uh, uh, situation, of local fiscal situation of the contract, we are basically selling uh, unit leak funds, uh, investment funds. Basically, this is what we are doing. Which means that if we do not have the internal uh, capabilities to manage ourselves these funds, we become only a distributor hmm. because we externalize 100% uh, of the management of the funds we are selling, which is not possible. Hmm. I mean, if we are only a distributor, we will get only the margins for distribution and we will share these margins with our agents. Uh, we have in uh, generally 150,000 agents all over the world. So it means that we need to uh, rebuild uh, the margins coming from, from the factory, 
and the factory being asset management factory. Mm. Uh, this is the only way. Uh, mm. And most of the insurance companies do not have uh, the internal asset management capabilities because mm. insurance company were used to manage mostly uh, real estate and uh, government bonds. Now, you still it's still good to invest in real estate. It's much more challenging to invest in government bonds for, the, for obvious reasons. Mm. So we need to invest in alternative asset classes oh. and we need our and our customers need to invest in those alternative classes. If we don't have the internal capabilities for this, those alternative classes, the only thing we're going to do is to pay fees to external managers, and we will give up our margins. Mm. And this is the new strategy for Generali. Generali, uh, two years ago, no, when we, uh, for one year ago, when we announced our new strategic plan, we said that we are no longer an insurance group, we are an insurance and asset management group, mm -hmm. and we are building a multi-boutique platform to acquire the internal uh, asset management capabilities. This is, mm. uh, for me, very important because it, it, it drives the change of the life insurance business. So let's talk a bit about um, the big buzzword in Brussels, which is Green Deal. Um, so. Uh so a complete transition of our economic system uh, away from a carbon intensive uh, production um, and consumption towards carbon free consumption and, and production. And of course, one big component of this Green Deal is um, financing investments into green infrastructure, all kinds of green uh, uh, things. Um, you're a major investor but you're also someone who goes in the capital to seek funds. Um, can you tell us how you deal with the greening of our economy and what's your strategy behind that? Well, first of all, I think that um, uh, green investment uh, are a part of uh, sustainability. And I would say, because I, I prefer to talk about sustainable growth than about sustainability, uh, which is very different because <laughs> uh, you can become very sustainable, uh, well, very sustainable, uh, apparently very sustainable uh, if you stop any kind of, of growth. But this is, at the end, uh, sustainability without growth is not really sustainable. So it's important for me not to talk about sustainability, but to talk about sustainable growth, mm -hmm. because we need to grow. The, the, um, so for, for uh, generally, it's, it's really important. I, I <coughs> said at the beginning that for us, uh, Europe matters a lot, but for us, sustainable growth matters a lot as well. Uh, we decided to embed sustainability and sustainable growth in everything we do, not only investments, but also in underwriting, in managing our business, managing our people, in everything we do. As a matter of fact, we uh, enter, we are one of the only uh, Italian companies in the uh, Dow Jones uh, Sustainability uh, World Index, in the Dow Jones Sustainability uh, European Index. Mm. Uh, we were the first uh, European group to issue a green bond. We acquired uh, in France an asset management company, a majority stake in an asset management company named Sycomore, which is uh, specialized in uh, ESG uh, investments and which is one of the European leader of the ESG investment. So for us, mm. this is part of the business. There, there is no business out of sustainable growth. And this obviously uh, includes uh, green investments and we decided to invest uh, 4.5 billion euros before 2021 on green, on green investments and to divest from uh, uh, investments uh, related to, to, to carbon. Uh, climate change is a significant part of uh, sustainable growth. It's not the only part, uh, but it's a significant part. And we, uh, we think that as <coughs> an investor, as an underwriter, we can definitely contribute to this. And we need and we have to contribute to uh, to this. Um, when you talk about uh, green investment uh, and when you talk especially about uh, 
the European uh, Green Deal, which is uh, mm. definitely a great idea. And you know, in generally, we manage 500 billion euros of assets, and we hope that uh, a significant part of it, at some point, uh, will be invested in, in green investment and will be part of the of the Green Deal. We uh, we hope that we'll be able to contribute mm. to this. But I think it's uh, very important to uh, improve uh, the cooperation between uh, private investors and, uh, and public sector. So um, public and private partnership is really important to, uh, uh, to create the condition for the, for the green investments. Um, mm. That's one thing. And it's very important to have a regulation which is consistent uh, with this. Uh, if the regulation is uh, not consistent with, with what is willing, with what yeah. are willing the, the politicians, which are the expression, who are the expression of, of the people, uh, there will be an issue. And I mean, as of today, on this point? regulation yeah. is not always consistent with the, the public policies and w with yeah. what we could do. I mean, on, on, this this. on this point, I mean, the, the regulation, you mentioned regulation is, of course, very important. Um, there's a big debate now on the taxonomy, right? I mean, so, so you said 500 billion uh, is, is the amount uh, you invest in assets. But, of course, most of these assets are brown assets, right? I mean, they are assets of companies mm -hmm. that are probably relatively carbon intensive um, in their production processes. So... so um, how d how do we how do we get this shift in the asset allocation that you really start investing into uh, green uh, companies and green products and green pro uh, green bonds and so on and so forth? I mean, the regulate is the re is it only the regulator that has to play a role here, or should companies, big investors, big asset managers like you, shouldn't they themselves um, go ahead and? Uh, sort of reduce their exposure to uh, to brown uh, brown assets and increase exposure to uh, to green assets. Okay, <coughs> well, this is a definitely a very important and very complex uh, complex issue. Let let me give you a, a few a few examples. First of all, we are still as uh, insurance companies uh, very much invested <coughs> in government bonds. So we invest right. In companies. Uh, we invest also in countries, mm. uh, in states. Some of them are green, some of them are not green. So we th should think about it when, when we invest in a country through a government bond. We should consider uh, the, the, the color <laughs> of, the, of the country, <laughs> which is <laughs> the green rating of the country. So I think it's important, you know. Uh, to, to, to work on this as well, uh, because it's very nice to uh, talk about the index, uh, sustainability uh, index for companies, and I think this is really important. We need to rate, mm. uh, to rate the companies on this uh, standpoint, not only on the financial standpoint, but on the sustainable st standpoint. This is really important, but we should rate countries as well. So no investments in U.S. government bond anymore since <laughs> they dropped out of the. <laughs> of I will of obviously Paris. not answer to the to this question, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I I think uh, uh, sustainable rating is important for countries as well. And right. as an investor, yes. before considering uh, buying government bonds, we are going to look at this mm. as well. Uh, second thing. <coughs> It's very important that uh, the cost of capital which is allocated to the, the asset class is consistent with what uh, we could do as an mm. investor. I think that as an investor, uh, we need to be able to uh, uh, give um, a yield to, to, to our customers because this is what they are expecting and this is our job to be able to provide the yield to our customers. And we need to, to get this yield through our investments. So we have this uh, uh, commitment to our policyholders and our customers. In the same time, we have, a, as a sustainable company, a commitment uh, towards the, the, the community and the society. So it's important to be able to invest in real assets because real assets are the assets that grow the economy. Mm. Um, unfortunately, 
the cost of capital allocated to uh, real assets is much higher than government bonds, which are considered as a risk-free investment. And mm. this is the way the regulation is working. Is this consistent uh, with, with what we want? So on the one hand, <coughs> the regulation is requiring for more and more uh, capital from uh, mm. uh, insurance companies. And in the same time, we know we need to invest in real assets uh, for the sake of the uh, yield given to the customers and for the sake of the society and, and the world. So uh, we need to, to, once again, to make the regulation consistent with what we have to achieve. And then the cooperation between public and private is very important. Let's talk about infrastructure. Uh, there are mm. so much money uh, ready to in be invested in uh, infrastructure programs. And I think that, obviously, we need to invest in green infrastructure, right. obviously. Uh, so uh, if an infrastructure is no is considered as not green or as not sustainable, investor will not consider it. Um, so we need to invest in, in green infrastructure projects. The money is there, ready to be invested. We don't have an enough programs. Mm. Mm. So if we want to have enough programs, and I think this is... Well, that's the government role uh, to, uh, to build up the programs. Right. Uh, sure. Government uh, needs <coughs> to take their responsibilities and the cooperation between them and between the investors will be very productive. Will be very productive. So... Uh, so so, so perhaps on on uh, since we, I mean, uh, just to bring in also the audience yeah, on yeah. on this discussion because I see a lot of questions coming in on the green issues, right? And so, so I, I mean, let me just read one. I mean, Wolf Wolfgang Eichert um, asked the question: uh, How do you see a green supporting factor for capital requirements to promote sustainable investment? Yeah, it has to come. It has, it has to come. Mm -hmm. This is really really important. It has to come at. I would say at the beginning, because in uh, in ten, I don't know, in a few years, 100% of the investment will be green, which is a good news, because I, I don't want uh, you to misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not pessimistic. Mm. I'm saying what should be done to <laughs> create the the condition, and I'm I'm optimistic because you know. Um, when I look, when I listen to investors, not only us, but all investors, they are really committed to sustainable growth, to, to green investment. And, and this is why I, I'm very positive. Um, investors are more and more long-term investors because now long-term is the only way uh, to get significant uh, yield. Mm. Uh, so... And this is changing the way you invest your money. You are less short-term. I would say you are less cynical. You are looking long-term. You look at, the, at the, uh, the impact of your investment for the society. So I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic, but definitely uh, uh, you sh we should uh, right now uh, consider uh, having uh, light uh, capital costs for green investment. This is really, really important. But it's not enough. If I take the example of the infrastructure, we also need projects. Yeah. Um, perhaps before we talk a bit about regulation, let me bring one more question from the audience um, to, um, uh, to, uh, to also involve them. And I, I, I we got actually two questions which are quite related. I mean, the, f the first is uh, by... Mr. Anonymous, uh, by um, Mr. Anonymous, yes. What do you expect in applying AI, big data, and Internet of Things in the financial services industry? And related to that, a person called Brit asks, how do you see the relationship of insurers with big tech, the GAFAs? Uh, and is this an opportunity or a threat? So big tech... Um, uh, big data, IoT. I mean, how do how do you how do you see that uh, and the relation to the insurance industry? Well, I think it's uh, it's a great of, uh, AI and uh, IoT are definitely a, a great opportunity for insurance company to improve uh, the service they offer to to the customers, to improve the way they, they manage their business, the price their business. <coughs> You know, data management has always been 
the core business of insurance companies. Okay, the difference is that before to make the the price for a motor insurance policies, we we had to manage about uh, five five informations, for example. Now we can manage millions of informations. So it's it's uh, different. What's different is the quantity of information and obviously the way you you use them for uh, making the the price. But this is our job to, to manage data. Now we have to uh, build a data analytics platform to be able to, to manage uh, millions or tens of millions uh, of, of data. So it doesn't change completely uh, the, our business, but it gives us an opportunity to give a, a better pricing, a better uh, service to, 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 to customers. When you look at Internet of Things, and I think that in, in generally we are very well ad advanced uh, in this, we have, uh, we are the leader in Europe of the connected cars. Mm. Uh, we have uh, almost two million connected cars, so uh, we are the the only one being able to uh, offer to our customers uh, a price based on their behavior, uh, not only on the use of the car, but on on, on the way uh, they drive. Uh, Can you explain connected cars? I mean, what what uh, you have a device in a car which yeah. sends information to to the company. So right. we know exactly. Uh, we don't want to know so you as where, an where they are and wh and what they are doing. This is none of our business. But we know how they drive, how much they drive, and how they drive. Okay, and we can uh, give the price for this. So, uh, so, so reasonable drivers have to pay less uh, less insurance fee. Is that absolutely? Absolutely. Okay. And then, on top of this, we are able to provide the guidance to the to the drivers uh, when we see that uh, they are not cautious enough. We we tell them, and we help them to improve the way they drive to reduce their risk and to pay less to to, to us. This is the kind of business we are in. So we are connecting the houses as well to help our customers to better monitor the risk of the house. We are connecting the people. You know that we have a, an exclusivity with um, uh, the South African company Discovery mm. for the Vitality uh, program in Europe. <coughs> and vi what is Vitality? We've been launching it in uh, Germany, in France, uh, in Austria, uh, in Spain. It's a, it's a program to help people uh, to have a healthy way of life. Mm. So they have... Uh, a watch which is connected to the company and we help them to, to walk uh, every day, uh, uh, we mm -hmm. help them to have uh, better food uh, and so on and obviously uh, to, to, to go to the gym and these kind of things and obviously if they do this, if they have a healthier way of life, they will pay less insurance to us. So this is uh, one example of the huge potential of the Internet of Things. Right. And how do you deal with the privacy issues and, and so on around this? I mean, customers, not every customer will want to to well, be told uh, to drive more reasonably or to eat no, no, healthy. <laughs> they choose. They, 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 decide. They, they, they decide. So they have an option to it, opt it, out and then uh, they have to pay the high fee. It's nothing oh. is mandatory. If they want to pay <coughs> uh, more money to us, uh, they're welcome, by the way. But, uh <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Okay, so uh, so let's perhaps talk uh, talk for a few seconds about, and I think we have a few more a few more minutes, five more minutes, um, to uh, talk a bit about um, about regulation of the insurance industry. Uh, solvency um, is of course solvency too. Is um no, I think uh, I, I I've said it. Uh, I mean that uh, solvency two is uh, under review by uh, EOPA. I hope that the objective of the review will not to uh, require more capital from the from the companies, but I think that uh, uh, the major insurance companies in Europe are very solvent. There is no solvency issue. Uh, the the real issue may be that uh, there might be too many insurance companies in Europe. We have four thousand insurance companies in uh, in Europe. Not all of them will be able to invest in uh, digital uh, technologies, 
to invest in asset management capabilities. So this might be mm. an issue also for the regulators. <coughs> so um, I think uh, the objective should not be to, to require for more capital, but the objective should be to, to, to put to, to make uh, the regulation consistent with the needs uh, of the people, uh, with the need of the society uh, in terms of uh, green transition, for example, and sustainability. This is, for me, what, what matters a lot. Because the objective of Solvency 2, which was to, to secure the policyholders through the solvency of the company, has been achieved. There is no insolvent companies in, in, in Europe. The objective of Solvency 2 has been achieved. So I'm not saying it's a bad regulation. I'm saying that the review of the regulation is an opportunity, is an opportunity to make it consistent with the goals, with the sustainable, sustainable goals right. of, of the society. So I have one last uh, question from the audience, um, which uh, goes to the previous point um, by a person called Antonio. Um, how to strike a balance between the use of data and the risk of exclusion uh, of individuals, um, of those who don't benefit um, the perfect, uh, I mean, who don't have the perfect profile. I mean, how do you deal with exclusion when you use these big data on customers? Yes, I, I would say well, this is a, uh, an interesting question because it's about the mutualization, which is the... Uh, I mean, the core of uh, the insurance uh, industry. I would say that there are two ways to, to, to mitigate this. Uh, first of all, uh, a regulation, because uh, in some case, uh, insurance is mandatory. And when insurance is mandatory, uh, it's normal that we should not uh, exclude anybody. I think this is fair, and we need to find uh, solutions to guarantee pricing solution. Uh, to, to, to guarantee uh, people with high profile of risks. And depending on the countries, there are solutions. Uh, and I think this is also a commitment <coughs> we should have to, to, to the society. When a line of insurance is mandatory, we should not be able to, to exclude anybody. Um, then uh, there is also uh, a market, uh, a market uh, mitigation. Mm. A, a, a competition mitigation, okay? Because uh, uh, it's true that with uh, data analytics, at the end, you can know exactly what is the risk of a person. A and we are still not using uh, predictive data. Yeah. If you look at insurance, uh, health insurance, if you start entering in the genetics and uh, you can use more and more uh, predictive, uh, predictive data. I think uh, that this is really personal. People should use it, and we, we could help the people to use it uh, to, to for prevention, for prevention reasons, not for pricing reasons or for guarantee reasons. This is, this is important. So it's also a matter of regulation. But at the end, if we uh, are close, clo the more we are close to the real price uh, of the risk, uh, the more uh, we are close to, to making the insurance useless. Because why should you insure yourself if you pay for your real risk? So uh, the mitigation is mutualization. And at the end, uh, you can be, uh, uh, if you offer the perfect price, you will be alone to offer the perfect price, and you will have no more customers. So there is, uh, mm. uh, there is both competition mitigation and, and regulation mitigation. So I think it's important to maintain, uh, to maintain uh, a significant uh, mit uh, mutualization of risk. And I think it's important to use more and more the power of uh, data analytics and, and also of uh, uh, pr predictive data to improve the prevention services to customers mm. for them to improve their quality of life so this is uh, this is what we have to do to help people improve their quality of life through the use of data and we can help them uh, using and managing their own data without looking at them without looking at them 
Absolutely. Thank you very much for um, your insights and sharing your insights from a, a major European uh, company, insurance company. Um, I think we all learned a lot. Uh, thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Thank you to thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.